Number one, no one really cares. They like and they comment and they're on to somebody else. If you think about it, like the yeah. people we think really care about, I guarantee you there, there's nobody really, uh, except for your friends right now, no one's thinking about you. Welcome to the Far From Average podcast, where we speak about topics and interview people who are far from average, so you can take your business and take your life to the next level. I have an extremely special guest with us here today, but before we get into it, I just want to mention the sponsors. A lot of you guys have been asking me, do we have a Patreon? How can we get more content? How can we get more access to the guests? We put together a Patreon. And one of the first things that we're going to put on the Patreon is my ebook accelerator program. So as you guys know, I've been an author for many, many years. I've written a lot of ebooks for myself and others. So I put together the formula that I have used to write the ebooks, to publish the ebooks and physical books all in the Patreon for less than a McDonald's Big Mac combo. So click the link either down below in the description or wherever you're watching this to get access to the Patreon. But like I said, with our guest, Daryl Drake. We got a lot of special stuff to talk about today because you hit millionaire status by 25, right? Yeah, yeah. A lot of you guys, and including myself, were early 20s. We're going to be coming up on that 25-year-old or 25-year mark. So I kind of want to get the blueprint and kind of get into your experience on how you went from wherever you started to being that millionaire at 25. So take us back to when you got started in entrepreneurship. I mean, really, like, you know, it's so crazy when I get asked this question because it's, there's no one thing. There's no one thing, right? Uh -huh. Like, a lot of times when you think about someone that's successful, you think of it as, as an event, something that just happens. But really, it's a combination of things, right? And so for me, my start uh, really happened when I was young, uh, around 13, 14, I started working at my mom's clothing store. Mm. And then uh, after school, I would either be doing that or I would be selling candy. And so wow. and so that, that, that taught me the work ethic. And then it just kind of transferred into, like, being a young adult. Now I'm going door to door. I'm selling alarm systems. I'm knocking on 100 doors to get two people to say yes. Dang. But I'm making $300, right? And so yeah. that was my first experience to um, going from, like, a 9 to 5, essentially, to, like, you're going to get paid in direct proportion to the value you bring. Yeah. And so then I start saying, oh, wow, commission? So I can take this for sure, well, I don't know what it was at that time, $10 yeah. an hour, or I can go out there and make $200 an hour, 2000 whatever, right? Yeah. And so um, I fell in love with that process of, like, just being able to, to go up, like, get up in the morning, go to work, uh, selling alarm systems, and if I had a really good day, I may sell three or four in a day. I may have, yeah. I may have a two thousand dollar day. Yeah, or I may have a zero day. But it's up to me. It's up to you. You know what I mean? How important do you think that sales experience was in creating some kind of advantage for you in entrepreneurship? Um, I think it just taught the discipline. I think what we lack right now, especially in this generation, is uh -huh. the discipline. Because we live in this immediate microwave society to where we think, like, we should have something immediately. And so I think that that part of my life was so crucial because it, it taught discipline. Mm. It taught me that, hey, you know, attrition is real. I may have to go through 150 doors to make my $1,000. Mm. But the doors are there. They're and there. as long as I get up and put one foot in front of the other, I can go and make it happen. Yes, absolutely. And I think uh, in this day and age, I got not, not to date myself, but I think <laughs> the social media entrepreneur, um, they don't have that stick to itness in most cases, right? They want to, uh, okay, I, made a I took a pretty picture. I made the post when the algorithm told me to make the post and where's my customers? But it's like, no, you have to cultivate. You got to cultivate the audience, right? And for me, what that meant was I had to knock on 100 doors, maybe get 20 leads from that to convert it, follow back up with the 20 leads, and keep doing that. Yeah. And social media, it's the, same, it's, it's the same concept, but people are just going out and launching a product with no systems in place. Mm. So now they're not doing any follow-ups. They're not re-dripping on, on, on customers. They're not uh, – I mean, it's just a lot of different things that I was doing before social media. Yeah. Um, and now there are just more automated ways to do it now. Yeah. But I was still doing it back you then. You were still doing it back then. 100%. What was your first business that you started? That I that I started? Yeah. So the first company – because it was not – Or entrepreneurial company. venture. Yeah. Because I know it's kind of different. You make that transition. Yeah, I think the first time – it. it I don't know if this would be considered it, but like I said, I was selling candy. So mm -hmm. I would buy the candy wholesale, 
right? So I would buy it at like a, a Costco or whatever, and then I would sell it. Uh-huh. So a, a piece of candy bar that I bought for sixty cents, I'd sell for three dollars, mm. right? And and that's it started there. And then my first actual business was a company where we were selling like legal services, mm-hmm. and so essentially you would prepay for legal services and uh, for a legal, a legal service. And I built an organization there, made my first hundred thousand, and um, and that was kind of like my first business. Yeah. And then I got into credit repair. Uh-huh. And that was like my thing. Because I was an independent contractor with the other company where it wasn't my product, wasn't my business, but I can go out and sell and make a commission. Yeah. So credit repair was my first business where I, it was my service, right? Uh-huh. It was my business. And, and so that is where um, you really understand what it means to be a boss, right? Where, yeah. you, where you're, <laughs> you're paying for everything, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. And you're paying for it a lot of times before you even see a profit, and so um, mm-hmm. and so that's the difference between a contractor, right, and an actual business owner. See, most people are contractors; they're third party, they're sourcing. See, but when you have your own business, see, with, with contracting, th- you, there's no way for you to really take a loss because either you sell the product or you don't, you don't. But it's not it's not your product; it's not your overhead, right? Uh-huh. Whereas with an actual business. You can buy this, that, all the stuff you have in your podcast area, and and not blow up. Yeah, and you took that loss. Yeah, and that's real entrepreneurship. And I think most people are not willing to take that risk. Uh huh. And so, you know, it's it's just a little bit different. Is there a route for people who don't want to take that risk? If you if I'm like, okay, I want to make more money, mm-hmm. but I don't want, like you said, I want to have to buy the mics, the setup. Yeah. What route do I take then? I would I, network marketing. I mean, network marketing, in my opinion, is is the easiest way for you to step in to entrepreneurship without having to worry about the overhead of it. Yeah, I think that you know, not entrepreneurship. It, it is. It, it's not for everybody, but it is for that person that really has made up in their mind they want to be an entrepreneur. Uh-huh. I wouldn't suggest going out and spending fifty thousand on a business or a hundred thousand on a business. And you will hear critics say, Oh, well network marketing isn't sure isn't a real business. It isn't sure. They can close the doors tomorrow. Well yeah, your your business can close the doors tomorrow too. Right. Mm. But the only difference is it's not a risk. Right, right. Yeah. So I love I'll always be indebted to network marketing. Um and I think I tell anybody, I tell anybody this, right? Any if you take a kid and they graduate from high school. Uh-huh. There's two places I would want them to go. Either to the military to create discipline or network marketing to build character. And and they're, and they're both interchangeable, right? Yeah. I think going into the military, right, they're going to be well-traveled. They're going to have that discipline to be able to get up and do what they're supposed to do every day. If not, they're in trouble. Right. right? That creates a habit. And then uh, our network marketing where you start to deal with person, different personalities. You start to deal with leadership. You yeah. start to have, you know, you start understanding what it means to go on a hundred appointments and everybody turn you down or, or someone says, Hey, I'm on my way. And then they don't show up. Like, yeah, that's, that's, that's how this shit works. Right. Yep. And so I think that, um, putting people through that early on, it builds character. Yeah. And you're, you're kind of like a network marketing legend almost. I don't know if you, this was years ago when I was, cause right after high school, I got my real estate license and mm-hmm. then I got involved in network marketing. Mm-hmm. I think I met you at an Eric Worre event. Probably back in 2018. Yeah, so obviously you've been doing great in network yeah. marketing. You've been able to build several organizations. Mm-hmm. What kind of skills does someone need to really be successful? Because you said you have people booking appointments, mm-hmm. don't show up. Mm-hmm. hundred people tell you no. Mm-hmm. What kind of skills do I need to get people to tell me yes? The number one skill is, is belief, right? Mm-hmm. Like, that, I, I mean... Everything else comes second to that because if you wake up in the morning and you don't believe that you can do it, but you go out and do the activity, the belief will will cancel, mm. right? It'll cancel out everything that you try to do because even if you move forward, like, well, I don't believe it. Let me knock on this door. The person that you're trying to sell to is going to pick up on that energy. So I think okay. it starts with belief as saying, you know what? This is something I want to do. This is something I can do. This is something that was, was appointed and assigned to me in this season of my life, and I'm moving forward confidently. Mm. From there, right, you have to learn, you know, different things, people skills, time management, having discipline, stick to itness, um, the ability to build a culture and what is leadership. I think, you know, to get to the top of any industry, but especially network marketing, um, there's no one thing that gets you to the top. Okay. Um, but it's, it's a combination of, of everything that I just mentioned. Yeah. Now, you gave kind of more of an overview what what got you to the top though? Belief 
it's so funny I share this, man. And it's, okay. It, because it's true. And even if you scroll back, like, in some of my social media, some of my old, it's about 10-year-ago videos, and I'm talking about, you know, <laughs> I'm driving to my Impala saying, hey, one day this is going to be my Bentley. And it's still dated. It's still online, right? And so, uh-huh. or, or me saying, like, one day, you know, not even one day, I'm so happy and so grateful now that I make $100,000 a month. I'm so happy and grateful now I make 100000 a year. Just my level of belief and showing up and going to conferences and, like, just jacked out of my mind and, and almost – you know, acting as if I already made it to, to that point. Okay. And I would be, I mean, I remember going to Oklahoma, one of my first trips in network marketing and having to borrow the money from my sponsor's mom. And she gave me $500 to go from San Bernardino, California to Ada, Oklahoma. And, and it took me years to pay her back. It took me years to pay her back, but I was able to pay her back uh-huh. um, tenfold. And it was just one of the, the most defining points of my career because number one I didn't have my own hotel Mm. um so just like me there are a lot of other kids and they you know for her to sponsor me she's like you're not gonna get your own room get in where you fit in right so I'm sleeping on the floor but I'm in college I don't care I'm just yeah right and so um you know we we drive a bus all the way from San Bernardino to Ada Oklahoma Uh uh-huh I'm in a nosebleed seat and I see this guy talking on stage shout out to Darnell I see him you know uh talking on stage and I said, man, one day I want to be like that. And I think at that time, you know, he was a definitely a seven figure earner. Uh-huh. But what I what I was so attracted to was just the way that he handled his family and, and the way he handled business. And for me, I think every every everyone every new entrepreneur needs that person in that industry that inspires them. Okay. Right? Like any basketball player or rapper or doctor or whatever, they have that one person that they study, even in art, right? Somebody always says, this happened. I seen this person that came before me do this and it inspired me to do it. Yeah. And that and that still stands true for me today. There's some people I see and I say, man, I like, I like the way that he does that. Yeah. And, you know, I just kind of keep that in my pocket. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Now, what, at what point do you expand from – just being a network marketer or just doing that mm-hmm. to the credit repair business, what made you take the jump? I mean, everything that I do is is really an extension of me. Uh-huh. So it, it only made sense because either I'm doing it because I feel like it's something that I needed at one point in time and I needed to provide because the market wasn't ready for it at that time. So for me, I, there was no um, Lexington Law, you know, shameless plug, right? There was nothing that, that I knew of at least. Uh-huh. So I'm talking 10 plus years ago. And I had had a repossession on my on my credit. And so I said, you know what? Like, I don't have the money to go pay somebody to do it, so I'm going to figure out how to do it myself. And at the time, my girlfriend's mom was in credit repair. Uh-huh. And I funny, I guess it's kind of funny. I didn't know that she was in credit repair until I found out. Uh-huh. And then she was like, yeah, I'll show you how to do it in exchange for me doing it for you or showing you how to do it. Just, you know, work with me, basically. So uh-huh. she hired me, essentially. And... um. And once I realized that I knew how to do it, I said, well, there's other people like me that's going to need this. And then yeah. that's how I started. And then I, but what happened was I was referring my friends and family to her at first. Uh-huh. And then she's like, you know, I'm, she was done with it. She went into like owning trucks and cold stones and all the stuff she ended up doing. So she basically kind of handed the baton in a way. And I took off with it. Um, like, yeah. So what was the business that made you a millionaire? Um, network marketing. Network marketing. The industry of network marketing is where I made my first million. That is insane. Yeah. I know it's a, it's an extremely difficult industry, mm-hmm. and it has a negative stigma mm-hmm. behind it. I've been involved in it yeah. when I was 18, 19 years old. Mm-hmm. Why do you think it has that negative stigma, even though people like you are successful in it? I think any time there's a low cost of entry, um, there's going to be a high failure rate. Mm. I think any time that you can allow someone to do anything for a couple hundred bucks, uh, the excitement is going to lead them to it, and then they'll drop out because there's no true commitment. Could you imagine if a doctor only had to pay 500 bucks to become a doctor and they didn't have to get educated? That would be We'd wild. have a bunch of people fail doctors. Yeah. Right? Same thing with being, uh, you know, a dentist or a real police officer agent. or a real estate agent, right? I think that because in network marketing – we oversell the possibilities, mm. right? And we undersell the the challenges. Yeah. Um, I think that leads to a bunch of young people coming in, paying their money, and not understanding, like, hey, this too is a business. It's, it's an easier route because it's less risk. Right. But you still, hey, to, you have to pay, right? You have to, to in order to, 
participate in the promise, you have to practice the principles. Yeah. And that goes from to any industry. I don't care if it's being a, a athlete or a drug dealer or a rapper. At the counter of success, you will pay for retail. And so I think that it's the lines get blurred in social in um, network marketing mm-hmm. because you can just join. Like literally right now, you can hit a leader up in any company and say, "Hey, I'm ready to join. How much does it cost? Okay, three hundred bucks. Here you go." And now you're in network marketing. Yeah. No way. And, Man, and because of that, that's that makes why. Sense. That's why people. That's, yeah, why, that's people, why the yeah. failure, failure rate and everything is so high. Mm-hmm. What stopped you from? Backing out when, th- when things I, get, got I, tough. I guarantee you there are more people that failed at college than failed in network marketing. And no one says college is a scam. Damn. Think about how many people dropped out of college. I know a handful myself. Right. Like right now. And it's like no one is yelling that that's a scam. Because here's the thing. It's like going to the gym and paying for a membership and then not losing weight. And then saying the gym is a scam. Wow. But you have to go there and work out. They don't say, oh, I'll give you a six pack just because you paid the subscription. Yeah. You have to work. Same thing with college. Just because you enroll in college, I don't care if you're going to Harvard or you're going to the local uh, JC. Yeah. Regardless, when you enroll, you have to pay full price at the counter of success. Dang. And so that's what I think. That's that's tough. So by 25, Mm -hmm. a millionaire in network marketing, Mm -hmm. how many companies did you have to go from in that period of time? Because I know a lot of them end up shutting down. Yeah. They are... they change the comp plans. It can get really complicated. How many companies did you have to go through? Two, really three, but one was an affiliate deal. I think I got really popular off of that company, um, but it was more of like an affiliate. It wasn't like multi tiers, like three three levels maybe. But I would say I would say I would say two. Two. Mm-hmm. And when you're building the organization, how did you get people? Because in order to become a millionaire, you had to get people that also produced under you, correct? Sure. How did you find the right people? to stick as opposed to those people who just want to pay the 200 and they'd be like, I'm out. This isn't working. This is a scam. Often. I mean, I always tell people the pace of the leader determines the pace of the pack. If there's motion, there's motion. And usually people that want to be in motion find things that are in motion. And so, yes, it was me going out there um, and, and looking and pitching and, doing that whole thing, going up to people at the gas station, like, hey, do you or anybody want, you know, want to make money, right? <laughs> uh, I would never do that now. But uh, but I would still do it just in a different way. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I just feel like if I could do this thing all over. Yes, break if, that if down. I, if Start I could, an organization today from zero. Because I want to, I want people to understand, because a lot of times what I get this, they think it's like this one thing. And then I confuse myself because I'm like, man, I want to give them this one thing. But it's like when you, once you arrive at a place, you realize as a, there's no one thing. Because it's, it's almost an unfair advantage. Uh-huh. I mean, an unfair disadvantage because I tell you like, oh, you have to be good at following up. Right, but I, then I leave out going out and actually planting seeds. Getting but then I leave seeds. out: Do people even like you? Then I leave out. Right, so it's like mm. it's so many different things. Me being a likable person, me being consistent, me finding people. To your point, me finding people that were like me. Because here's the thing: even if I get a person that is not like me to join, nine times out of ten, if I'm their leader, they're gonna fail because we're not speaking the same language. Yeah, can't, you can't feed a cat dog food. Mm-hmm. Right, it had you. You have to be aligned. So it was really just going through all the numbers until I found someone that was really in alignment with with my way of leadership. Yeah. Um, but if I can do it all over, um, I would just be louder, faster. Uh huh. Yeah. And like, what do you mean by that? Let everybody know what you have going on. If you have a podcast, everybody need. I would walk around with a podcast shirt or like. I mean, just. I just think that we're in a place right now to where noise beats out talent and it's unfortunate but you can have a person that really knows what they're doing yep but not as loud as a person that doesn't know what they're doing and the world society will think that the loudest person is the one that knows what they're talking about. yeah and how would you leverage mentioning social media in the podcast how would you leverage it now versus when you first built the organization because i'm sure it's a little bit different well yeah because now at the click of a button i can be in front of however many people I want. Mm -hmm. I can make a post right now and be in front of tens of thousands of people. Whereas in order for me to do that 12 years ago, how? There was no way. Yeah, it was tough. You know what I mean? It was tough. Maybe there was a way, but I don't know. And I couldn't afford it even if I knew what it was. So, but now, right, you can, 
what happens is your content uh-huh. will make room for you. So, like, if, if you have dope content, they'll share, they'll, they will share it for free. And when they share it, that is a lead for you. And now they go to your page and they see what you're about. And they're like, oh, okay, cool. Well, boom, that's that's a lead. And so um, if I could do it over, or I mean, I'm even doing it now, but if I could do it over, if, if or if I was 18 or 19 or early 20 right now, uh-huh. I mean, I would be using social media to be as loud as I can. Yeah. And before, I mean, this is an old saying, like, there's no bad publicity. But even so now, like, the, the, you got to think the Internet, they don't forget, but they forgive. Mm-hmm. So you can you can literally, as long yeah. as you don't go too over the edge. Yeah. Bro, you go viral one day, they're like, oh, this person, people troll, troll, troll. Still hit follow. Troll, 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 <laughs> troll, troll. But then, why are you following me? Yeah. Right? So... Now I just act, you know, when I see little trolls and stuff, I'm like, oh, this is a game. No problem. As long as long as I get you to voice some type of opinion, then I, I'm in your mind and I'm okay with that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now to kind of go back to the credit repair stuff, mm-hmm. when you had the negative item, I'm sure people who are listening, they have negative items on their credit report, mm-hmm. a couple of things here and there, late payments. What was the process in getting that repossession move removed? So at the time, you could simply you know, really write in, write into the bureaus. I mean, it's a little bit different now, but back then the bureaus won't, weren't as hip to it. Now everybody is just trying to remove shit that shouldn't be removed. But before, you know, you, you can go and you can just uh, request that they remove it. Um, as crazy as it sounds, it oftentimes would work. Wow. Um, now, they, I mean, now it's, it's a little bit more um, tiresome but the reality of it is just because something belongs to, to you, like let's just say that repossession, it was valid. Uh-huh. Right? I didn't pay my bill. They repossessed my car. They put it on my credit. That's fine. Well, I don't dispute if it was mine or if it, or if it wasn't. My dispute would be the accuracy of what it is because uh-huh. sometimes they may have the wrong name. They may have the, the wrong repossession information, uh, th- th- you look for inaccuracies. And if there's anything inaccurate on the credit report, it has to be removed. Mm. It has to be. Right. And that's what people don't understand. And and there's another thing. The three bureaus, it's not the government. It's not. It, it's just a, we can start a business right now. Yep. It's and a we, privately owned company. Yeah. So it's like, but I think because they credit controls so much of our life and our ability to have things, I think we, we look at the credit industry like you know the irs in a sense you know what i mean and it's like no it's not if you tell the company to remove it and you have valid reason for them to remove it then they need to remove it yeah absolutely it's that simple so now you just have to get more creative with the language you may have to you know use an attorney you may have to just uh, have somebody that can comb through and see exactly and they're most like 90 plus percent of credit reports um contain some type of errors be it an address, uh, be it a reporting cycle, um, uh, improperly uh, reporting the utilization. There's mm-hmm. a lot of different things. And here's the thing. Up until recently, there was no checks and balances in place. Yeah. So the credit bureau, you could literally walk into the hospital and say, my name is John Doe. And that's not really my name. John mm-hmm. Doe, right? And they go and do a procedure on you. 5000 uh-huh. bucks. The real John Doe will get that bill. There's no checks and balances. There's, I can just tell you what my social. Have you ever went and filled out your social in your name at a doctor's office? And you're like, why do you need my social? Yeah. And then they don't even ask for your social security card. So I can literally just be somebody else. And just say whoever. Dang, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. And so it's like there's no verification there. And now, so, I mean, especially in the medical space, I mean, a lot of people were seeing things that aren't supposed to be theirs and the the thing is that uh-huh. that hurts your score. Uh-huh. If you have a medical bill, those are tedious. You have che- you're in check systems or different things, and a lot of the times, you know, a lot of times it is the people, right? But believe it or not, a, a large portion of um, negative negative uh, accounts on someone's credit is not 100 percent accurate, right? And sometimes it may not even be theirs. And so our job is really just to help them to remove whatever shouldn't be there. Okay, okay. Now you mentioned. Check systems. Mm-hmm. I'm sure some of you guys never have heard of that. So let's speak a little bit about the third-party credit bureaus and the importance they play yeah. on that process. 
Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll start with the check system. So check systems really is basically the bank's uh, way of communicating to one another that you've done bad business. That's the simplest way I can put it. Okay. Right? Like I know back in the day there were people that were given given checks and then you go deposit the check into an account and then if the you know if they pay you out now, you're in check systems if you can't repay that. Yeah. Right? So it was this big fraud that was going on. But a lot of people were coming to us from check systems. Uh-huh. They're like, you know, this guy told me that I can deposit a $2,500 check and he'll give me half of it. I said, well, first of all, why would he do that? Yeah. But when, when you're 18 – you don't know. It's like it's common sense. Maybe he needs help cashing his check, right? Like you just don't know, right? At 18. <laughs> naive. Yeah, you're naive. And so, but I mean, and it was just a wave of that happening. Uh-huh. And so I learned how to get people out of check systems. Um, and check systems basically, like I said, it's, it's, it's a database where banks communicate to each other to say, you know, really your banking history. Mm-hmm. And so you definitely want to. Um, Credit score for your bank accounts. Essentially, yeah. Yep. So you 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 definitely don't want to be in check systems because it just doesn't allow you to establish a relationship with a bank. Oh. Yeah. 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 So what we do at at Repair for Free is basically we don't do credit for you. Um, uh-huh. We do it with you. So we have a dedicated staff of coaches. We have um, basically an online portal where you can log in. Uh, it scans your report and then it populates the proper response to send off to the bureaus. And then, um, and then, on average, it takes about three to six months to completely uh, clean uh, clean the file. Wow! And so, before we were charging anywhere between eight hundred to fifteen hundred, but we were doing the work. And I say, you know what? Right now, how how can I still do what I'm doing without you know without taking up so much of my time? Yeah. But then still also teaching. Right. Uh So because now inside of our community, inside of Repair for Free, what it is, is you're doing it with us. So it's not a do it yourself. It's a do it with us. But we're teaching you along the way. Okay. So we're teaching you why we're disputing things the way that we are. We're teaching you home ownership. Mm -hmm. Right. We're teaching you the difference between buying a a three hundred thousand dollar home with good credit and buying a three hundred thousand dollar home with bad credit. Oftentimes you pay, you know, you could be paying two to three times more in interest on that house. Same thing. And all because you're short 50 points, mm. right? And so, I mean, I can go on and on about that, but it's it's so much more expensive to have bad credit. Yeah. Bad credit is expensive. It'll cost you. And so, um, and so we, we, you know, we're trying to teach that. We're trying to build a community around just financial literacy. Financial literacy. Mm-hmm. I read that, uh, what was your goal to inspire or get, was it five, 500,000? 500,000 what? People teach into the, your financial literacy academy. Oh, a hundred thousand. Oh, it was a hundred thousand. A hundred thousand. Yeah. So, what's the game plan for that? Because obviously they don't teach it in schools. Yeah. Yeah. How do we get people to really care about financial literacy and their credit score, especially at a young age? I think. I think. I think they they find it because life is hard. So for me, I didn't find credit repair until the need hit me. I have a repossession. I can't get another car. And I think, you know, when you don't know what you don't know, it's like, how do you know the value of money until you make it and then lose it? You don't really know. There's, you're 18. You know what I mean? And so I think that most of our clients come to us when they're, you know, about to get married, right? Yeah. They want, they're about, they're preparing to buy a house. They got a baby on the way. They want to buy a car. They want to start a business. And so they start looking for that service. Um, and so, of course, that is a, a, a very reactive way to think about it. Yeah. Um, but how do you be proactive? I mean, you create the community. You make noise around the community. You let people know one day you will need credit. Yeah. But people will do more for the possibility of gain than they will uh, for the, the loss, yeah. essentially. And so sometimes, you know, you got to get hit on the hand mm. a little bit to say, okay, I shouldn't have spent that much money doing yeah, I, I've oh, had those I moments have my too. Credit, you know what I mean? And yeah. so I just think that uh, my part of reaching 100,000 people is, um, is is really just simplifying the process where I'm giving all of this to to them in, in a community form. Because when I was – it's only so many people that we can do personally, right? Even if I had 20, 30, 40, 50 people, a lot goes into credit repair. So instead uh-huh. of doing that, we created the system to where now you can do it with us and now we don't have to go out and mail the letters and handwrite and all this yeah. stuff. You know what I mean? And 
Yeah, it's and quite so, the process. And that's how we can go from, you know, 3,500 people to 30 to, to 300,000. It's more scalable. Mm -hmm. You can deal with more people. Yeah. Now your book. Yeah. What's what's the book about? Because I couldn't find anything on it. Yeah, because uh, I haven't dropped it yet. Oh, you haven't dropped it no, yet? No, but it's done. Give us a preview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so my should I? Yeah. So Just a small one. You don't have yeah. to reveal too much. Yeah, yeah. So essentially, it's really just about my process, my life. But what I did in that, I think that the genius in that was that I, I take them through my life. But the book is about the lessons. Mm -hmm. So I tell the story of my life. Yeah. But then when things have happened in my life, right, because er, er, what is the secret? Okay, so I'm going to give you 20 chapters in a book. Uh -huh. And I'm going to take you through each step from when I joined my first network marketing company to where I thought I was on top of the world to then losing people that I thought would never leave me because we're making money to then going through depression to then going and coming back and making millions of dollars in, in a 12 month time frame. Like, so I take them through each lesson in that while telling my story. Ooh. And I, and, and the idea behind that was to say the best way to tell my story to where I'm not in a, like, look at me, this is my story, but to, to, like to teach yeah. is to put it in a book and the next, you know, put it in a movie or something like that. Yeah, that would be dope. I just wanted the reader not to just be inspired uh -huh. by my words, but really to learn the lessons in that. Okay. You, you get what I'm saying? Yeah. And so it's not enough for me just to say like, hey, in business, some people will quit on you. People don't remember that. They remember stories. They remember how, yeah. you, how you make them feel. Like if I say something right now, you might remember what I say. You might not, but you're always going to remember how I made you feel. Yeah. And so in my book, I, I try to like, like really dive into like who I was in that moment. Yeah, that's dope. Now, yeah. one of the reasons I started this podcast is to get in front of people like yourself, people mm -hmm. who are far from average. That's why, that's why the name of the podcast is Far From Average. Mm -hmm. Your story, you, got, you have a great story of getting into an industry where the failure rate is high, yeah. but still succeeding. Yeah. So what makes you so much different or so much further from the average person? I think either, either you got it or you don't. And I hate to say it like that. Whoa. And all these gurus will come on here and be like, you're the superstar. You're the superstar. Anybody can do it. No, you can't. Maybe your personality doesn't allow for you to, to be in the entertainment industry. Uh -huh. So you have these people that you, everyone has a level of genius. But maybe you're in a space and you're trying. You, you keep hitting a brick wall because who you want to be and who you're supposed to be are not aligned. So for me, I just feel like number one, make sure that what you are saying you want to do, it's you that really want to do. And I always say uh -huh. that discernment is is knowing the truth, and the truth is how you feel about it. Mm -hmm. So let's just say you have to know the difference between, hey, listen, I'm trying, I'm trying, I still love it, but I'm failing to where I'm trying, I'm trying, I hate this shit, but I'm still trying. No, 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 no. If you don't like it, if you don't like getting up and coming to set up a podcast and have your guys, like if that, yeah, if, I you love it. if you don't love that process, soon as someone doesn't show up, you're done. But if you love it, you just kick the shit like, oh, that's crazy. He said he was going to come. He didn't come. All right. What's next? Yeah. You know what's what I next? Mean? Who's next? That And that's network marketing. It's like because I loved it so much, it's like, damn, he had me drive an hour to this meeting. He told me it was going to be 200 people and it's 20 and no one signed up. That's crazy. But my mentor told me that was a part of the process, so I'm cool. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, um I just think properly educating your expectations is is crucial to where it's like, it, it, you have to know that you know that you know that you're built for whatever it is that you're trying to do. And no matter how passionate I am, uh -huh. no matter how much I want to be a musician, no matter how much I sing in the shower, yep. I, if I can't sing, I can't sing. Wow. And I can't walk around saying one day I'm going to make it. No, you're not. Damn. Find something else. Take that passion. Find out something else you may be good at and put that same resilience that you have for singing, uh -huh. put that into something else. And I think that we live in a society where we don't want to title anything. We don't want, like, we're very sensitive these days. Yeah, that's how I felt about you know? basketball, dude. I was like, man, this, yeah. I don't got it. Yeah. I don't got it. But uh, I found something to where I did have it. Yeah. How did you find that? Well, I, the rewards along the way. Uh-huh. I'm going to keep it real with you. If you fell in, if you're completely failing, completely failing at any one thing, for more, in this day and age, for more than a year or two, I think you should do something else. Mm. 
Now, I'm not saying if you're not making money. I'm not saying if, you know, it's not working based on the plans that you set because maybe your, your goals are too high. Maybe you don't understand the process. Yeah. I'm saying that if you have a podcast uh-huh. and you can't get one person to sit down with you for two years. Wow. You're not likable. You need to do something else. Wow. That's all I'm saying. So, you know, like if you're in college and you can't pass one class and you've been there two years, <laughs> you should probably go do something else. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. And so, um, and so, yeah, I just, I know a lot of people are not going to like that because that's not the feel good stuff that the, that the world is into right now. Yeah. It's like, if you make me feel bad, you're oh. anti this. It's like, <laughs> yep. no, man, relax. It's it really, you know, I always tell people, if you're going to fail, do it fast. Get up and, and keep going. Uh-huh. I don't want to avoid failure. I want to hurry up and do it and fail so I can see, like, okay, I fail, but, yo, bro, in, in that failure, I learned this, this, and that. So when I say a failure in two years, I mean complete. Like, there's nobody here. You're not even excited about it. That's Man. a failure. The, the rest of it is like, you know, if, if let's just say, you know, you're getting one or two. You're getting some motion, but you realize you're the camera guy, you're the editor, and you're doing this. Maybe you shouldn't quit. Maybe you just need to bring somebody on. Yeah, to help you out. Right? Maybe you're just missing a piece of the pie. So mm-hmm. I just think, uh, and then, and then. You know, also talking to people around you. Now, here's the thing. Don't allow blind people to, to proofread your vision. But in the same token, sometimes outside criticism is okay. Because sometimes we can yeah. get lost in our own cloud. Yeah. And we don't understand what other people are seeing. And uh-huh. at the end of the day, yes, it is about you. But we don't want to get too deep into it to where we are not being realistic. Yeah. You know, we need to say, hey, what do you what do you think about this idea? Hey, watch my podcast. Let me know what I could do better. Yeah. Yeah, right. L- listen to me sing. Tell me if, if I have a chance, right? <laughs> right. And, that's how, and be for real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah be and, for real. Uh, people are going to typically be honest. Some even really crucially honest. But, yeah. yeah. But you, uh, those, are, those are things that you need to hear, man. Yeah. But I got massive value out of this interview because I'm coming up on that mm-hmm. 25. Yeah. And obviously, I want to make some massive moves within the next year, mm. a year or two. Mm. And most of you guys are male and around the same age. So I think you guys can take a lot from what Daryl has said on this podcast mm. and apply it. Figure out what you're good at. Find something, stick to it for a year, two years. Get some motion in some things. Mm. Start building your sales and leadership skills so you can position yourself for success in whatever it is that you want to do. Yeah. Do you have anything else for us today, brother? I mean, lastly, I just say don't don't delegate to to – to neglect what it is that you're supposed to be doing because that's only going to lead to you bringing somebody on board uh-huh. that could be fucking up and you wouldn't know because you didn't take the time to learn it. I'm yeah. not saying if, if you, if, if okay. you see what I'm saying? I did that before. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Like I'm like, Oh, I don't feel like doing that. So let me hire somebody. But if he, if you don't know what they're supposed to be doing, then how do you even check? Yeah. How do I know if you're doing it right? Yeah. yeah. And, that, and, 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 and I just think for, for early on people, it's like, Learn as much as you can about your business, Uh but then don't spend million-dollar time on penny projects. Learn enough to say, hey, bro, are you sure you're doing that right? But don't spend your whole – because you have to stay in your genius. So if you know you're best right here doing the interview, you don't have to learn 100%, but you can be able to look at the camera and say, bro, the lens isn't even on. Isn't it supposed to be, like, on? You get what I'm saying? I get exactly But a lot of times we're in this era where we want to outsource. Okay, I'm going to use this person for that. I'm going to use this person for that. I'm going to hire this person. And I'm going to sit back and make all this money. And before you know it, your business is ruined. And now you're mad at them because you gave them X amount of money on a retainer and they didn't get anything done. Well, because where there's no vision, the people will perish. So when they don't, when, 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 when no one knows the vision and then you're not, you're, you're, you know, you're delegating, but you're not really verifying that they know what they have going on. It, it can get really messy. And I know that was yeah. one of the biggest lessons. I got to a point wow. to where I was making money. And so I wanted to buy back my time. That's what I did. Right. And so I'm hiring ads people. I'm hiring this person. I'm doing this. And then I realized like I didn't spend 15,000, 20,000 or whatever on this agency. And the whole time, I got nothing from it. Nothing happened. And it was partially their fault, but it was really my fault because right I didn't on. even know what they were supposed to be doing. Yeah, man, that's huge. So that's huge. In my in my closing, I just say, you know, learn whatever industry you guys want to be in, learn as much as you can about it and find out where your genius lies inside of that industry. For me, I know that I'm great with people. 
for me, I know I have leadership skills. Um, uh, and so I, I stay in my genius there. But I know on the back end, there are a million different things that go into making what I do happen. And I find people that are competent in a way to be able to help uh, keep me from having to do it. Yeah. But, you, you know, you still want to know your shit. Um, yeah. and, that's, and that goes for anything. 100%. Anything, man. 100%. So. When is the book going to be out? I don't know. I'm waiting on my team. Like, you know, every everything got to flow the right way. I mean, it's been done for, I don't know, a couple months now, uh-huh. maybe a year. But a lot of things have happened, so i kind of been pushing back the release date because mm. I need it to be in alignment with other things that I have going on. Okay. Yeah, and so being a, and another thing, be in a hurry for nothing. Be anxious for nothing because everything that's divinely meant for you is already on its way, um, and you rushing it is just going to lead to anxiousness and disappointment. And I think that's where depression comes from. Depression, co- The depression starts where you have an expectation for something other than what is. Okay. Watch this. Because because if you were okay and you were in a flow state to where you're like, I'm okay with what is happening, then you believe in a process and, and you're good. Yeah. Anxiety and depression comes from you getting so frustrated because I had a deadline and it was supposed to happen like this or I had a – and then you get flustered and now you're de- you're depressed, you're, you have anxiety, you want to yeah. quit. And, you know, have no expectation. For, I, I say, like, mm-hmm. set your goals. Yeah. Right. Have a deadline. That's fine. But never get too emotionally invested in the results too soon. OK. Don't check the scoreboard. It's the first quarter. Why are you looking at the scoreboard? It doesn't Do, even really matter. Just shoot. Play your game. And then, you know, at crunch time, you start looking, you know, checks and balances. But yeah. when you start getting caught up in what the audience is saying and what the score is, and man, this person just hit two threes in a row. And yeah. nah, man, you got to stay in your lane and stay in your purpose and and don't rush anything. And and that was the main thing that I, I thought that even though the world was saying, man, you're killing it. You're, you're growing faster than many people in your industry. You're doing numbers that people twice your age, twice the time that they've been in the industry. Um and for me, I'm like, that's not enough. Like, I, al- I always wanted more wanted and more, more and more. And so oftentimes I would trick myself out the game, right, instead of just saying, like. Trick yourself out the game. Yeah, like like you get so caught up on what should be happening and what this person is doing that you cause yourself anxiety because you thought that you should be further along based on what they're posting. And some people are not who they post to be, P-O-S-T. So now you're competing with somebody that's not even really where they Say they are. Right. And now you're getting yourself out of your game. But if you're staying in the lane that you're supposed to be in with your blinders on and you're trusting that God has appointed something to you and it's yeah. on the way, there's no reason to look at the scoreboard because what is is already here. Yeah, I had that issue, man. I had that issue big time where yeah. I'm like, I felt like, oh, I'm better than, I, I'm better than this guy. Like, yeah. why am I not there? Yeah. And all the while, they're not even where. Come on. They're not even where I thought they were. Right. And even if they're there, that's their process. Exactly. That's their timeline. And you're not going to compare yourself to their failure. Nope. Like if they win it right now, you looking and you call and, and you going through all the shit in your head. Yeah. And they fail next year. You're not even looking at them. You're yeah. Like, oh, it's like, God, okay. I hope I, yeah, I, hope, the next right. guy? <laughs> I hope I don't go that way. Right. So you don't, you don't know what part of what, what part of the book you came in, in their story. Yeah. You don't know what chapter they're on. Mm-hmm. They could be on the rise right before the fall and you trying to emulate them and they on their way down <sighs> expeditiously. Right. On, so you want to stay in your lane because you pop in on a store, you pop in on somebody's feed and you look at them buying a Rolls Royce, but you don't know that they about to go in their houses in repossession. You don't know they about to go through foreclosure, they car in repossession. They they can't, you know what I'm saying? So it's like stay your lane because you don't really know. You don't really know. It's, and it's tough with this Instagram culture and stuff. I got caught up in it so bad. Mm-hmm. Buying things I shouldn't have bought, yeah. doing things I shouldn't really be me doing. Me too. Yeah, me too. But the thing is, number one, no one really cares. They like and they comment and they're on to somebody else. If you think about it, like the yeah. people we think really care about, I guarantee you there, there's nobody really, uh, except for your friends right now, no one's thinking about you. Yeah. Like except for like a few people in my life, they're not really. Now when I post, okay, cool. I've been there, there in their mind for 30 seconds. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. And then on to, on to the next. I, I just bought a Lambo. Oh, that's cool. 
on to the next. Yep. No one cares. So when you really start to say, you know what, I'm about to just play my game. I'm about to play, like, literally run my race, play my game, because y'all really don't care. If I do something really, really great, you really don't care. If I do something bad, you really don't care, because we all have our own issues. Yeah. So when you start to approach life in that way, like, man, I don't give a fuck about nothing that anybody is doing. I'm just going to stick my course. Then you start doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing, because now you're not overspending, trying to chase the appearance of wealth. Yeah. Now you're not... You know, being inauthentic, you, people can see it. You know what I mean? And so, but when you're just you and you're chill and and you're confident because you know you know your shit. Yeah. You're untouchable. Yeah, because patience is true confidence. Because now what's cool is now, it, what's cool now is really corny. Because cool has become so overpopulated to where it's no longer cool. It's like when, when, when someone has a certain type of watch, it's cool until everyone has it. Yeah. And now it's like, man, take this shit. I don't want it. So now authenticity in content is, is what's real. It, yeah. you, can't, you, can't go, you can't go and be like, look at my Lamborghini anymore. People have seen it too much. It's watered so, down. Desensitized. Desensitized. Yeah. Now I need it. to know, okay, you got Lambo, great for you. Um, even if you really have it and you really can afford it, I don't care. What is the value that I'm about to get? Yeah. That's what I care about now. Sure. So, yeah. Man, great episode. Great episode. Cool. I really do appreciate you coming on, man. Yeah. Spend some game. Guys, watch this episode two, three times. Really take notes, especially if you're young and on the come up in your entrepreneurial journey. Mm -hmm. Also, before we leave or before we go ahead and wrap up, where can we find you on social media? Yeah, Daryl Drake on all platforms. Um, and, yeah, what, uh, I think I have Twitter. I don't think I have Twitter. I don't be tweet. Okay. We'll <laughs> link everything below. Yeah, TikTok, uh, Instagram, Facebook, but base, but mostly Instagram. Mostly, mostly Instagram. Instagram. Yep, yep, yep. And so then, we'll have uh, everything linked down below. Yep, got a blog coming. Already wrote tons of content for that. Um, and, of course, repairforfree.com. It is completely free, you guys, to be able to go in and actually get started on repairing your credit. Again, it's repairforfree.com, a completely free service. The only, only thing you have to pay for are your credit uh, uh Credit reports, which no matter where you go to get your credit done, you're going to you need reports anyway. But uh, our process is completely free. You're going to get a coach. Again, having a coach is completely free. My idea really is to, co to, 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 to put together a culture that is now more financially responsible. Mm -hmm. um, and then even inside of that, we're teaching like uh, uh, home ownership. We're teaching mm. just because you can buy a car doesn't mean you're buying it the right way, right? You know, we're teaching so much how to apply for credit cards, how to get loans. And all of this, again, is free inside the community. Wow. So it's definitely something to check out for sure. That's huge. I'm going to have all this stuff linked down below. And I will see you guys on the next episode. Peace. Peace.